5. Japanese Mini Submarines On December 9, 1941, Kazuo Sakamaki washed ashore on the east side of Oahu. When he woke up, Kazuo was greeted by American Sergeant David Akwe and placed under arrest. He became the first POW in the Pacific Theater. His sub, a Taipei Kohiyoteki class submarine, was one of five that were supposed to take part in the infamous Pearl Harbor attack the day before. All five subs contained two crew members and were armed with two torpedoes. Their intended role was to show up during the aerial attack, fire torpedoes, and escape back into the waters. Before the attack began, they were ordered to slip into the harbor in the middle of the night, hours before the airstrikes even started. At just 78 feet long, those manning the mini-subs understood that this was likely going to be a mission with no return, but it would make them heroes back home in Japan. These mini-subs were actually more of a risk to the mission than an asset, according to the flight commander who led the air assaults. If spotted too soon by the Americans, they would cause the Japanese to lose their crucial element of surprise, which is what the entire mission was based on. At 5.45 a.m., almost an hour before the attack, they were almost discovered. At 3.42 a.m. on December 7, 1941, hours before the aerial bombing on Pearl Harbor, the cargo ship USS Condor spotted a submarine's periscope sticking up out of the Pacific. They reported the sighting to the USS Ward, who made contact by firing at it twice. The second shot sank the sub at around 6.37 a.m. right underneath the ward. The operators of the secret Japanese submarine were the first casualties in the Pacific War. Immediately after this exchange, the USS Ward reported the incident to Pearl Harbor's naval command. Unfortunately, the information went largely ignored, was met with skepticism, and didn't make it through the chain of command fast enough to stop the next tragedy from unfolding. A grave mistake. Usually, on Sunday mornings, a lot of the ship's fleet was sleeping, Unfortunately, the U.S. was caught off guard and unprepared. A total of 18 ships, the pride of the Pacific, were either sunk or damaged by the time Japanese warplanes withdrew. The states lost over 200 of their planes, and more importantly, over 2,400 sailors, marines, and soldiers, with another 1,247 wounded. The Japanese delivered a devastating aerial attack but their mini-submarines failed miserably. Much like the mini-sub taken down by the USS Ward, three others were laid to rest at the bottom of the Pacific. They either suffered mechanical failure or were taken down by American ships. The mini-sub belonging to Sakamaki, the man found ashore, was in a league of its own. It had a defective gyroscope. Then, as it tried entering Pearl Harbor, it floundered three times on a coral reef. The crew was struck unconscious by a misfired shot from the American destroyer USS Helm. Around midnight, still dazed from his concussion and the toxic gases in his sub, Sakamaki awoke to find himself on the opposite side of Oahu. He lit a fuse and threw himself overboard in a desperate attempt to sink his sub. That was also a massive failure. When the fuse refused to light, Sakamaki's crewmate drowned and he washed up on shore unconscious earning himself the new title of Prisoner of War No. 1. When he awoke, an American sergeant was standing over him. His sub was also found, and after studying it extensively, it was used to promote the sale of war bonds in the US. Today, it is displayed at the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas. Another mini-sub was found near the entrance to Pearl Harbor in 1951. It was discovered in shallow water and appeared to have extensive damage after being shot down by the USS Monaghan. After it was raised by the US Navy, it was taken out to sea, where it was quietly laid to rest in the deep water. In 1960, another was discovered. It was still equipped with its bow and armed with torpedoes. These were later removed by the Navy before being dumped at sea. It was returned to Japan in June 1960. It is now on display in the former Naval Academy at Itajima. 4. Penicillin Possibly one of, if not the most important discoveries ever made, penicillin was accidentally created by Dr. Alexander Fleming, a Scottish bacteriologist. He was working on an infectious disease called Staphylococcus aureus. 
During summer vacation, he apparently left his laboratory a complete mess. Mold juice was the original name for penicillin. When Fleming returned in 1928 and realized that a green mold called Penicillium notatum had contaminated petri dishes in his lab and was killing the bacteria he had been growing, he knew he had unintentionally created antibiotics. Contaminated and therefore no longer any good for his work, he went to clean out his petri dishes. That's when he noticed something strange. Looking closer, he realized that anywhere the mold was present, the bacteria wasn't thriving. In a lot of places, it was completely eradicated. In order to test how many different germs it could kill, he isolated the mold, increased its growth, and conducted experiments. It ended up being a large number. As we now understand, penicillin prevents bacterial cell wall formation. Without new walls, there can be no new cells, which means no bacterial growth. Death from an infected scratch was a major possibility just a century ago. Something as simple as a dental procedure or a deep cut could have drastic consequences. Anything from cutting fruit or fighting in a battle could result in a deadly infection. This is what drove Fleming to pursue a solution for infection control. During World War I, he served as a captain in the Royal Medical Corps and had experience working in French combat hospitals where troops lost their lives thanks to septic wounds. Fleming's work was discovered and expanded by Oxford pathologist Howard Florey in 1938. They collaborated with a scientist named Ernst Boris Chain, who escaped from Germany. Norman Headley, a British scientist, advanced the research by cultivating and refining penicillin. The biggest problem facing them was how to grow enough to make a difference, and with World War II in full swing, it was more vital than ever. Dr. Norman Headley was growing penicillin in every available container he had, but it wouldn't be enough. Luckily, Flory had connections at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Percy A. Wells was just the man they needed. It was there that they came up with an idea to use submerged fermentation to grow more. An injectable, mass-produced version of penicillin was available as early as 1942 after extensive study and testing, and a trip to the United States when Flory and Heatley collaborated with American experts. It came just in time to help World War II injured soldiers. The statistics support this claim. Although in World War I, bacterial pneumonia claimed the lives of 18% of troops, it did not do so in World War II. It all started with mold juice, and penicillin went on to revolutionize the way we care for open wounds and illnesses. By the end of the war, American pharmaceutical companies were producing about 650 billion units a month. Did you know penicillin came from mold? Let us know in the comments and be sure to subscribe to the channel. 3. Prehistoric Cave Paintings at Lascaux In the fall of 1940, Marcel Ravedat was walking his dog, Robot, near his home in Montignac, France, as World War II waged across Europe. Marcel quickly realized that Robot had fallen into a hole. He called out to his companion and heard a distant response coming from deep under the ground. When he went down to find the dog, he also found one of the most important discoveries in art history. The Lascaux Cave Paintings, which are some of the oldest known instances of human-made art, were discovered by the two. Hand-painted depictions of animals and prehistoric humans danced across the walls in the dim light of Marcel's oil lamp. The paintings were over 17,000 years old, and although he was probably the first human to have seen them in thousands of years, he didn't know it at the time. Marcel went on to tell three of his friends, Simon, Georges, and Jacques, about the incredible discovery. After some time keeping it a secret, the youngsters began to charge other kids in their village a small entrance fee to see it. But they eventually succeeded in convincing a local historian that they had discovered these drawings underground. To prevent any damage or vandalism to the artworks, he recommended that they forbid anybody from entering the cave. The lads took this advice seriously, and at the age of 14, Jacques persuaded his parents to let him set up camp near the entrance and watch over the cave to scare off any trespassers. He continued to do so during the winter of 1940 and 1941 and remained a devoted warden until his death in 1989, assisting visitors and caring for the site. 
What Marcel and Robot found that day is nothing short of breathtaking, truly an irreplaceable world treasure and piece of history. There was a significant influx of visitors to the area after the cave painting's discovery. The number of tourists entering the cave in 1955 was well over a thousand. Sadly, only 15 years after they opened up, the cave's enduring fame eventually forced a public closure to protect the artifacts in 1963. 2. Teflon Teflon was unintentionally created by Dr. Roy Plunkett. After earning his PhD in organic chemistry, Dr. Plunkett accepted a position at DuPont in Jackson, New Jersey. He set his sights on developing a non-toxic replacement for sulfur dioxide and ammonia. According to DuPont, in 1938, Dr. Plunkett, then 27 years old, and his assistant, Jack Reebok, were testing tetrafluoroethylene TFE, as a viable substitute. The TFE was produced by Dr. Plunkett and kept in small pressure cylinders, weighing about 100 pounds each. On April 6, 1938, when the valve on one of the pressurized cylinders of TFE that had previously been frozen was opened, nothing actually came out, despite the fact that it appeared to still be full. Dr. Plunkett and Reebok made the decision to open the cylinder to do more research. When they finally succeeded in cracking it apart, much to everyone's surprise, at the bottom of the can was a white substance. They discovered that the TFE gas had formed into a waxy white powder called polytetrafluoroethylene PTFE resin. Plunkett then started testing the new chemical to determine whether it had any special qualities. The material was incredibly slippery, non-corrosive, chemically stable, and had a very high melting point. Due to these properties, the substance's study was moved to DuPont's Central Research Department and given to chemists with trained expertise in polymer research and development. Dr. Plunkett was then promoted and moved to a different division that produced tetraether, which is used to increase the octane levels in gasoline. Teflon was later copyrighted and trademarked three years after the method was first developed. It was originally only used for industrial and military purposes because of the high cost involved with making TFE. After about four years, Teflon was made commercially available. Teflon was used in a variety of ways by the 1960s, including as an electrical wire insulation material and a stain repellent fabric. Also, the substance's most well-known usage as a coating for nonstick cookware started in the 1960s. It would later be used on rainproof clothing, car parts, and even fast food packaging. 1. Terracotta Army In March 1974, farmers excavating a well about 20 miles east of Jeanne came upon a hole holding 6,000 life-size terra clay figurines of soldiers. As soon as it was determined that the location was Emperor Quinn's burial site, excavations were underway. Historians say that the tomb was built over the course of about three decades by 700,000 people. According to early excavations and assessments, the site had a 20-square-mile footprint by 1975. The remains of a palace, offices, storehouses, stables complete with horse bones and actual straw, sacrifice altars and graves for killed employees, possibly to guard valuables from thieves, have all been found in addition to a pyramid bound, indicating the emperor's burial. Three of the four graves discovered had thousands of life-size figures, many of which were in pieces. The fourth trench, though, was empty, indicating that the site had not yet been completed. The about 8,000 terracotta warriors were organized in a military configuration and no two soldiers were exactly alike. In addition to the troops, the site also contained clay horses, metal chariots, weaponry, and other items. Less than 1% of Emperor Quinn's tomb has been excavated, even 40 years after its original discovery. Later, concerns about the possible safety risks associated with excavation replaced initial worries about destroying the bodies and objects inside the tomb. The clay burial mounds, 4,000 samples, were tested for mercury in 2005 by a group under the direction of Chinese archaeologist Duan Xingbo, and every single sample proved positive. Deliberations on whether to keep exploring the tomb at all in light of this historical and chemical evidence are still ongoing, as are questions about the best way to safeguard both the tomb's contents 
and the site's workers. Thanks for watching. Which of these discoveries surprised you the most? Let us know down in the comments and be sure to subscribe if you like the video.